Hi everybody, welcome to Afterburner, I'm Bill Whittle. Well, if you're a space geek like I am, you may remember this. Back in 1999, the folks at SETI, that's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, had a brilliant idea. With mountains of data and molehills of a budget, they set up a screensaver that would allow your home PC to process huge amounts of radio telescope data looking for that elusive signal in all of the noise, signs of intelligent technological life in the universe. And I know for a certain fact that I was not alone spending hours watching that screensaver crunch that data and hoping against hope that I'd get to see that little spike appear right before my eyes. Now, to say that I've been interested in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence for a long time would be to understate the case. I started working at the Miami Space Transit Planetarium when I was 13. I just kind of kept volunteering and essentially I wouldn't go away, so eventually they hired me. This was the view from my office for about 20 years on and off. So when I was standing behind this console in 1973, I was sure that we'd be hearing from all kinds of extraterrestrial civilizations pretty much the moment we turned our radio telescopes out there and started to listen. But it's 42 years later and nothing. Why? Well, using advanced computers and far, far more effective multi-spectrum radio monitoring, we've been listening for at least four decades, and we've covered a fair amount of ground, but it's silent. Why? Well, back in the 1960s, astronomer and astrophysicist Frank Drake published what became known as the Drake Equation. It was a way to estimate the number of intelligent and technological species out there, you know, people that we could talk to. Now, paraphrasing heavily here, what Drake was essentially saying is this. Take the number of stars in the galaxy. It's about 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. What percentage of those stars have planets? What percentage of those planets develop life? What percentage of planets would life develop a species with intelligence? What percentage of intelligent species develop technology? And finally, how long does that technological society last? Now, given 100 billion stars just in our own Milky Way galaxy, you'd think there'd be a whole lot of chatter out there. And at the time that Drake wrote the equation, there had not been a single extrasolar planet detected. But now we know that there are thousands of them out there, and it seems that many, if not most, stars have planets, and many of them must lie at the correct distance for temperatures to be right for life to evolve. Now, with life often comes intelligence, and with intelligence, unless you're a dolphin, let's say, might come technology, and then radio, and then the next thing you know, we've got one big galactic chat room out there. But, so far, nothing. Now, for the longest time, it seemed obvious that there's nothing unique about the Earth, but as it turns out, there really is. Our planet may have the one requirement for technological civilizations that may make it virtually unique among all of those millions of potential candidate worlds. Some astronomers believe that the only reason that this 21st century technological human society is here at all is because of the moon. Our moon is an absolute fluke, and that fluke may be the reason we're here. Now, the Earth-Moon system is best thought of as a double planet. Only the dwarf planets Pluto and Charon are closer together in size. Venus and Mercury have no moons. The moons of Mars are just asteroid specks. And while some moons are larger than our own, they orbit the gas giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and they're dwarfed by the size of their primaries. Now, when you look out at the full moon at night, you're really looking at a part of the Earth because our moon was formed when the first Earth, Earth Mark I, was struck by another protoplanet perhaps as large as Mars. Now, in this collision, Earth Mark I absorbed the smaller planet to become our planet, Earth II, but it also knocked part of the core and mantle of the original planet out into space where it coalesced to form the moon. So, the next time you look at the moon at night, remember, that you're looking at a big piece of us. So, where is everyone? Why is it so quiet out there? Well, many scientists are coming to believe that our double planet moon has stabilized life on Earth in a way that millions of otherwise hospitable worlds have not been stabilized, and that has given evolution enough time to lead to us. Here's why. 65 million years ago, an asteroid impact wiped out the most intelligent creatures on the Earth, the dinosaurs. Now, there have been many other extinction events deeper in Earth's past, but our unique, huge moon has saved us from countless impacts that would have otherwise hit the Earth. 
You know, most of the craters on the moon were headed our way. Some of them would have been catastrophic enough to wipe out the larger life forms and reset the evolutionary clock to intelligence back to zero. The moon is our shield, and many of the craters you see on the moon were meant for us. But the moon is more than a shield. It's also a vacuum cleaner. Computer simulations have shown that asteroids that simply would catastrophically impact the Earth are accelerated or slowed down by the gravitational presence of the moon so that they simply just miss the Earth. And over billions of years, our large moon at its distant orbit has simply swept up most of the kind of extinction-level events that would hit a life-bearing planet without such a guardian far more frequently than it does here in this one-in-a-million double planet of ours resetting the evolutionary clock that leads to intelligence and technology back to zero. This large, gravitationally powerful moon also helps stabilize the Earth's axial tilt, preventing catastrophic temperature changes that can destroy life in the cradle. And it's only because of our large moon that we have tides on planet Earth. And without tides, without areas that change from being dry to underwater and back every few hours, would it have been more difficult for the first fish to have colonized the land? You know, if there was an intergalactic travel agency, there would likely be millions of blue, life-bearing planets like the Earth, countless ring beauties like Saturn, and any other number of common wonders. But that tour would come to Earth to see something that, again, is so unlikely that it may make us virtually unique in the galaxy, and that is the solar eclipse. On other worlds, a big moon may obscure the sun, or a small one may cross its disk as a speck. But in what must be among the most amazing cosmic coincidences in the universe, our moon, while many thousands of times smaller than the sun, is actually many thousands of times closer. And by sheer freakish luck, it appears precisely the same size as the sun. This amazing coincidence, a total solar eclipse, may be unique in the galaxy. It must certainly be exceedingly rare. So how does that help technology? Well, these events were so dramatic, and the ability to predict them was so impressive that you could make the case that math and science began as a way to predict solar eclipses. You know, the Mayan calendar, designed expressly for this purpose, was the world's first computer. And in fact, the idea that these spectacular events not only could be predicted, but were in fact predictable, was the first indication that there was an underlying order to nature, and that is what gave birth to this entire idea that we now know as science. Now this year, there will be a full moon on Christmas Day, and a new Star Wars film is about to open. The last time there was a full moon on Christmas Day was 1977, the year the first Star Wars movie opened. So step outside this Christmas evening, and whatever your religious beliefs or lack of them, take a look at that shield of ours, our friend and protector, a piece of our own world torn loose to protect us here down below. The scars on her face were meant for us. The guardian and protector of life on Earth sits out there in silence, wondering when her children will return.